When I was seven years old, I stopped eating. My homemade meals of rice, rolled egg, and marinade meat were tossed into the trash can when teachers weren't looking. I did this for two long years, eating breakfast, trashing lunch, eating dinner. No one knew, not my parents, not my teachers, not my friends. So, what happened? Well, it all started with one ugly day. Like most second graders, I loved recess. There were 15 minutes of fun and freedom. We didn't have to focus on math or history. I loved running around the fields, playing on the monkey bars, and even mixing leaves with mud after it rained. I loved being a kid. But that all changed with that one ugly day. Three boys I didn't even know ran up to me, pulled back their eyes, and yelled, look, we're just like you now, before running off, giggling, and laughing. I was stunned. And in that moment, recess became this unsafe place where no one seemed to notice or even care if I was mocked and hurt. Before I even knew what the word meant, I felt shame. I felt this bitter insecurity, not towards the boys, but towards myself. To them, this was a joke, but to me, it was something that started an avalanche of self-esteem issues. Over the years, pulling back your eyes escalate, turning to something more intense. In middle and high school, it's pushing someone in the halls, calling them chink, zipperhead, queer. Sometimes they're just joking. Sometimes they're being serious. Either way, the word still hurts. Every year in elementary school, we made these about me posters to share who we are, our family, our hobbies, even our culture. I loved working morning to night on mine, eagerly awaiting how my classmates would react the next day. After that day, though, highlighting the Korean dumplings we made during the summer faded away to safer subjects, like our trips to Universal Studios. One year, the Korean parts of me were tucked away into the corner, and the next, they weren't there at all. I tried my best to hide away the obvious parts of myself, but if there's one thing kids can't ignore, it's monoliths and olive skin. It seemed even Trying to hide who I was still wasn't enough to avoid harassment. It's often said, hey, you'll grow out of it, but what's more common is that you don't. The shame and the hurt continues day after day, month after month, even year after year. For some, it may never leave. I never understood why I was being bullied. I just knew that I was different, and I had to change. Nearly all of those bright red anti-bullying posters encourage the same four things. Walk away, tell an adult, be nice to them, or tell them to stop. All of these recommendations put the responsibility and the blame on the victim. It's the problem and the solution is, is, is more complex than just telling something to ignore the harassment. According to the National Voices of Equality, Education, and Enlightenment, kids who are obese, gay, or with disabilities are up to 63% more likely to be bullied than other children. Further, the National Institute of Public Health reports that kids of lower socioeconomic classes report higher incidences of getting bullied. According to Clemson University, mixed kids report the highest incidence of getting bullied at 31%, with black kids next at nearly 25%. And that any challenge and attack during these formative years will no doubt result in negative consequences. For some, a decision is made to trade in the offending parts for an artificial, less offending self. It seems easier to fit with the crowd than to be oneself and under assault. With kids getting beat up in the halls just for being gay, it pushes other LGBT youth back into the closet. It's this kind of fear that made me look into embrace my genuine self. 
I'd been through enough harassment just because I'm Korean. I thought I didn't need any more for being bisexual, non-binary. I refused to come out to myself, to accept me for who I am. But suppressing your identity, it creates a tension that stays. It's hard to heal when you don't know who you are. For many who do find themselves coming out, they're often badgered and punished. Some are physically attacked, called slurs, or have their pursuits sabotaged. Few can survive in this hostile environment of being relentlessly torn down. Sometimes, after repeatedly trying, failing, and hurting, it seems as if the only viable escape is death. According to Yale University, bullying victims are up to nine times more likely to consider suicide than non-victims. Sadly, suicide remains among the leading causes of death of children under 14. I was only nine years old when I first considered suicide. Over the years, stress and unhappiness just continued to build until I was desperate for any solution, even an extreme one. Four years later, at 13, I decided that would be my solution. There's this odd sense of calm in having a plan and a date, knowing that in a few days the pain will be gone, and nothing will matter. My failed overdose resulted in an unpleasant trip to the hospital, then to mental hospital. There, I was among others like me, people who tried to take their own lives to harm from others. It was a common problem then and remains still too common today. With so many seeking and many even succeeding, it's reasonable to say that the methods addressing this problem are woefully inadequate. So, what do we do? How do we stop bullying that leads to humiliation, desperation, even taking your own life? Assigning nearly all of the responsibility on the victim isn't working, and why would it? After all, a victim is usually afraid to take any action, especially one that just might make the harassment worse. So, what do we do? I propose three actions that can help. Number one, Encourage bystanders to proactively derail observed bullying. A program done by UCLA in Finland seeks to increase empathy in witnesses. Using role-playing exercises and computer simulations, students are encouraged to interrupt the interaction. In the end, it notably improved their self-esteem and reduced their depression. Oftentimes, witnesses don't do anything, often fearing they'll be targeted next. But if kids were to learn that more intervention is more good than bad, and that bullying of anyone by anyone simply wrong should not be tolerated, harassment in the halls could be eliminated by peer pressure alone. This program was especially effective because most of the time, the students are being ostracized. It's important to create solidarity with bullying victims, and it's necessary for that to happen before you fully erase it. Number two create and enforce harsher punishments for those who bully, and especially those who drive a kid to end their life. It has to be apparent that these offenses will not be tolerated, and carry penalty, penalties severe enough to reduce such behavior. This is a life we're talking about, and the real possibility of expulsion, denied graduation, or even criminal charges are well worth the protection of those among us. Number three, start young. Teaching young children the value of accepting honor the value of accepting and honoring others, even when they're different, can make a difference to them and those around them. Providing a positive view to their young and impressionable minds is the key to making a long-term difference. I work with kindergartners every week. It pains me to think that any of those kids will have to scrub about me posters, throw away their lunches, or not be excited about recess because of bullying. Shouldn't all kids enjoy a safe and happy childhood, develop their identity in a positive way, and not have to reject a part of themselves just for the assault? That's what I want for my kindergartners. Don't you want that for your brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, and someday even your own children? And even then, just for kids in general? It's up to each of us to make that the new reality. We can start today with a heightened awareness of the bullying that goes on around us, and determination as individuals and as a community 
to take actions that make a difference. The problem starts and ends with us, and it's time that it ends. Thank you.